It was a small summer BBQ party with a few of our closest friends sitting in the backyard enjoying the view of the bay. I have never been sociable, did not enjoy company, easy laughter, comfortable communication that happens between friendly couples. This was all so new to me, and I have to admit that I loved it. All thanks to my wonderful wife, Sue. We have a large outdoor cooking table where Sue and I prepared the food before putting it on the coals. She was preparing a huge salad, and I was busy with the chicken. Have you heard that Bill Davis has moved? Annie, one of the wives, gossiped. Our guests sat on the terrace in the backyard. Dale, Annie's husband, trimmed and seasoned the steaks. Marie, the youngest in our small group, was mixing some kind of salad dressing. Rabbit food, not my favorite. Her husband Mark sat on a stool and watched what was happening. I couldn't blame him. Three bikinis were worthy of attention. My wife Sue laughed. Nothing surprising. I heard that he has been cheating on her for more than a year with one of the office workers. She rolled a couple of cherry tomatoes onto a heavy oak cutting board. Do you know what I would do if I caught him cheating? She asked, grinning. She took out a meat hammer and hit a couple of tomatoes with it, smashing them to pieces. The ladies laughed, as did I. Dale said, ow, which caused more giggles and quite a loud laugh from me. Annie looked at me. Do you think this is funny? She teased. Yes, anyone who walks to the left deserves what awaits him. I was working on cutting up some chicken and decided to try and join in on the fun. This is what happens if I catch someone cheating, I said, and picked up the chicken by the legs, twirling the carving knife between my fingers and over my palm, in my best Benihana style. The razor-sharp knife sparkled in the sun. I lifted it high and then chopped down the center of the chicken between the legs, and with a satisfying thud, I cut the chicken in half, driving the blade about an inch and a half into the cutting board. I didn't get the laugh I was expecting although both Annie and Marie giggled. Well, I've never had a good sense of humor, and in two quick movements, I carefully cut two other chickens in half to make them easier to grill. I laid out the chicken halves and realized that it had become completely quiet. Sue looked pale and abruptly dropped what she was working on and walked back into the house. The group dispersed, and only Marie and I continued to work alone. It looks like no one was funny, I muttered. Damn, I can't communicate. I was, Marie giggled, pouring homemade dressing into the decanter. I don't know what came over them. She started it. I wiped the halves dry and added salt and pepper. I love simple things, always have. It's surprising that my life became so difficult, even though I didn't complain. As I already said, I have never been the life of the party. Quiet outsider nerd, I've never been popular, not a jock not a ladies' man, not a member of an elite club. In the high school, I simply served my time without making any plans for the future. I didn't feel comfortable in large groups, but I was fine communicating one-on-one -on -one or with a couple of friends. I wasn't antisocial, I just preferred silence. I went to community college and got a job in my dad's night business, wiring and installing electrical, fire alarms, and security systems. The work was done outside of school hours, and for me, it was just perfect. They paid extra for this, and no one bothered me. A few months later, I had to fill out some paperwork and learned that I had received clearance to perform installation work for a large government contract. My father already had clearance, and apparently this made it easier to get mine. It was a pretty miserable job. I spent half my time in the ceiling running cable ducts through the walls. I pulled bundles of cables through non-standard holes, spent hours marking everything and calling connections. It didn't bother me much. I thought through everything and installed it methodically, checking and rechecking every wire, plug, and light fixture. Lots of paperwork, preliminary schematics, office electrical diagrams, acceptance documents, performance analysis numbers, I wasn't the fastest or the friendliest, but I worked thoroughly and never received a complaint due to poor installation. This kept the business humming because I did what I said I would do, when I said I would do it, on time, on budget, with the equipment I brought to the job. I had no idea that simply doing a project correctly 
was something unusual in itself. My cousin Jared was the one who introduced me to an opportunity that changed my life. It was quite unusual, moving to Antarctica and doing a huge upgrade on a government installation in one of the most desolate places I could ever imagine. My clearance got me in, and the hardship pay made the decision easy. You don't earn much more than usual, but with free food and housing, you save almost all of your money. I know it seems confusing, but it's important to explain how a poorly educated, not particularly smart, skinny, middle-class weirdo could end up living on the beach in Florida in a fully paid off house with a beautiful wife, a great job, cool toys, and interesting friends. There's not much to say about the work. Long hours, long shifts. Some people drank and there was debauchery, but not for me. I was simply petrified next to the girls. Again, being a social outcast, I did my job, volunteered for interesting assignments, and took advantage of the time and isolation to take college courses remotely and continue to work toward my degree. Oddly enough, I liked this life. I made several friends, and my bank account grew steadily. A year later, I had to leave for 60 days. Those were their rules. I returned home, worked a little more at my dad's company, and then returned to the South Pole. Most people came here out of curiosity or for the experience, and after a year we never saw them again. For me, the forced loneliness, isolation, and lack of new people to meet was simply paradise. During the winter, people mostly evacuated, and I had to become a jack of all trades. Well, good. To kill time, I studied, played sports, and in my free time learned all sorts of strange things from those who were ready to teach them to me. I mean, I had a lot of free time, a lot, and I had to keep myself busy. For some time, I became interested in magic tricks and constantly carried a deck of cards and coins with me. I loved improvised stunts where I performed magic tricks using whatever I could get my hands on. I liked tricks with rubber bands, ropes, and threads. No one has yet explained to me that magic is the last straw when it comes to women, the ultimate sign of despair. One of those guys who worked there for a short time taught me to play the guitar. Nice guy. Patient. He even sold me his old Martin when he left. He said he wouldn't survive another season. After he left, I learned from a burly Hawaiian guy that the ukulele is a hell of a lot like a guitar, but it's easier to play and much more compact. I've already played pretty well on it. Thanks to YouTube, I had no shortage of instructors after he left. In the second winter, when free time became too much even for me, I began to practice martial arts. Not widely known, but Escrima. From a funny little Filipino of indeterminate age. The nicest guy I've ever met, and he always smiled. He was already part of the contingent of scientists when I first met this group, and we were together for three years. I never became really good at it, but I enjoyed the pole exercises. More precisely, Yantokami. Otherwise, you could get a beating from Master Kano. I enjoyed practicing the kata. Master Kano always joked that I would rather become a show guru than win my first sparring match. I became friends with one of the Japanese chefs and persuaded him to teach me their cool technique of cutting food with a knife. Fun, but risky. For almost a year, I constantly wore patches, even using dull blades. One day, just for fun, he spent a few minutes teaching me how to throw them with and without spin. I got carried away and set up a 60 120 tray at the end of my room and marked out the spacing for one, two, and three spins. Often I would leave until late at night, until someone started complaining about the noise. In winter, there were few people, so there was no one to complain to. I simply completely destroyed the first two sets of knives. I've always been dexterous. I could spin basketballs and dinner trays on my finger, flip pens back and forth around my thumb, and roll a coin between my fingers. Whenever I had a free minute, I took out the cards and practiced lifts, fake shuffles, one-handed picks, turns, and passes. All this was part of my repertoire of card tricks. If not cards, then an old Zippo lighter, which I used to do various spins, slaps, and clicks. When no one was around, I twisted the knives or twirled the Bali song, I don't know why I always like to hold something in my hand while absent-mindedly polishing a technique, but it became a habit. Because of her, 
I always carried a deck of cards, a Zippo lighter, a butterfly knife, and a pair of custom tactical throwing knives that I used for both spinning and throwing practice. I had just finished cutting up chickens and was just sitting on the veranda. Sue was showing off her wedding anniversary gift from me, a new ring that matched her engagement and wedding rings. Neither Marie nor Annie had seen him before. The engagement one had a diamond solitaire. The engagement one was made of plain gold. The anniversary ring featured an arch of diamonds that wrapped around the single larger diamond on the engagement ring. I remembered the old three-ring rope trick that Diamond Dave taught me. I walked over to my parasol, took out my Bali song, and with a couple of moves, cut off a piece of the tension cord. It looked about the right length. At the same time, I was replaying in my head the routine pattern that is always necessary for a good trick. By this time, I had already attracted their attention and extended the rope. Sue, I said, put the engagement ring on the string. She looked confused, then smiled at the crowd and put it on the end. I showed that the rope was one continuous piece, hiding all traces of my deception. About a third of the way down, I tied a knot around the ring and asked Marie to check it. What are you doing, Trey? Asked Marie. I'm demonstrating something, I teased. I handed the other end of the rope to Sue again. Your wedding ring, please? She took it off her finger. You know I don't like to take it off, she said quietly. You won't have to anymore, I told her with a wink. Her hand shook as she put the ring on the rope. She loved this ring. I loved her for that. I tied a fake knot in it, this time in the middle, once again showing it to others, and asked Annie to check it too. Another magician's little secret. Involve the audience. As soon as she finished, I let go of the knot and took the wedding ring in my hand. That's the whole secret. Everyone thought that the action was still ahead, but the most difficult thing had already happened, and when they least expected it. When their eyes burn my hands later, it will be too late. Anniversary ring? I asked Sue. What are you getting at, Trey? She asked. I realized that during the year of living together, I had not shown her a single trick of mine. No wonder she was confused. Be patient, honey. She put the third ring on the rope. I tied it with a flourish, then leaned across the table towards the guys. Let's check it out, I said. While I was handing them the rope, I was already placing the previously removed engagement ring under a napkin in front of them. My body blocked it out perfectly, and now everyone has become part of the trick. Diamond Dave would be proud. Leaning back in my chair, I began to speak. Sue, I hope you know what these rings mean to me. I picked up the engagement ring, a large solitaire still attached to the left side of the rope. Promise, I said, showing it. I discreetly twisted the ring, turning it backwards, a simple, ordinary semicircle. I showed it, making it clear that it was an engagement ring. Most of the rope was hidden in my hand, Two equal-length ends hung parallel, creating the illusion that I was holding the middle of the rope. Such a simple and elegant trick. Commitment, our love for each other, and only each other. She nodded, some confusion still visible on her face. I waved around the new ring, the anniversary ring, the stones sparkling in the sun. I was proud. The trick was already over, and no one knew about it. It worked perfectly. Countless hours of training have paid off. The end of the rope hung loosely, revealing that the knot was on the opposite side of the wedding ring. A subtle gesture that enhances the beauty of this trick. Future. I said softly and mysteriously. I gathered the central part of the rope with rings into a fist. I handed one end to Marie. Marie, you were there the day Sue and I first met. I saw your love for Mark and thought how wonderful it would be to have something like that one day. Would you be kind enough to hold it, a symbol of our beginning, that first promise? I didn't think you were so dramatic, Trey, she said, grinning. She held the end, looking around the table. I passed the other end to Sue, who stood at the opposite end of the table, still clutching the middle, hiding the rings and knots. Sue, I can't rely on anyone but you in this matter. Will you hold this symbol of our future? Guard it? Certainly cute. 
I looked at the women. Take this in your hands, firmly. Don't let go no matter what. My past, present, and future are in your hands. My hand was in the middle, but my other hand slid under the table and took a half dollar out of my pocket. Marie, you guard the past. Sue, you guard the future. But who watches the present? If I turn my head even for a second, what will happen? I made them sit down. Damn, this was fun. I'm going to look away for a second. I want each of you to pull the ends of your ropes when I do this. I lowered my head, one arm still extended, providing the necessary cover. Pull. When they did, I turned my head away, unclenched my fist, and dropped the coin onto the glass surface. The characteristic sound of metal hitting glass was heard, and everyone gasped. I took the coin in my palm and looked up. The rope was stretched out, in a ring near each of the women, but in the center there was an empty cord. Trey! exclaimed Sue, looking around the surface of the table. Don't be afraid, my love. I may have looked the other way, but I never lost my way. I reached for the engagement ring, stroked the false knot with my finger, and the ring fell into my hand. I showed it and gave it to my wife. I took her hand and put the ring back on her finger. My promise stands. I put my hand on the ring in front of her face and let go of it too. I showed the anniversary ring and put it on Sue's finger. Our future. I will always trust you to guard it. I gave them time to inspect the rope. Two empty nodes. When the tension was perfect, I took it from them. I looked around the table. Damn it! The past and future are dealt with. But what the hell happened to the present? With the obligations? I tried to make it funny and managed to get a hint of giggle from them. I looked at the table. Guys, do any of you want to do me a favor and get my marriage back? They looked shocked, nervous, looking at each other and at my wife. I pointed to the napkin lying on the table between them. Mark picked it up and everyone saw the wedding ring. Annie and Marie laughed and clapped. Several seconds passed before the guys came to their senses, and Dale, making his way through the crowd, pushed the ring towards me. I think you've lost it, he laughed. I picked it up and examined it. In perfect condition. I winked at Dale. I never lost it. Trust me. I handed it to Sue, and she could barely get it onto her finger. It was shaking so much. I took her hand. It was just a trick, beauty. A little trick. We both know that nothing can interfere with our obligations. Nothing. She nodded slowly. I... I need to go to the toilet, she said, and stood up, almost running into the house. Marie examined the rope. Oh my God, Enigma, how do you know all this crap? It was amazing. I laughed. I realized that the mystery that shrouded my past was the most interesting thing about me. You're not the only one who has secrets, I teased, winking at her. Should I pour it, guys? I asked the husbands, who were sitting at the far end of the table, huddled together and whispering. I didn't have a girlfriend at school, and things didn't get much better at the polar station. I was no longer a virgin after a girl from a tanker picked me up during a three-day stay with us. During two overnight stays, I received an interesting education. She was stocky, dense, and unceremonious, and for the last two days it seemed to me that I had fallen in love. During my last winter, I began a strange relationship. One of the scientists, an elderly, attractive married woman, suddenly approached me. Can I buy you a drink? She asked. I don't drink very much, but I won't refuse. And yes, I'll treat you. I smiled. Stupid, I understand. She earned three times more than me. I ended up buying her a Long Island on the rocks before she got up the courage to come out with what she had in mind. Trey, can you keep your mouth shut? She asked me. Always, Dr. Ross. I knew her. She was Master Kino's assistant, but we were hardly friends. How long have you been here? She asked. I know that you were here when I arrived two years ago. Kino says that you have been here longer than him. This will be my fifth winter. Fifth? How do you stand it? I mean winters. Summer is not so bad. It suits me. I have a hobby. 
I'm self-sufficient. I don't need a lot of entertainment. She twirled her hair like a nervous teenager. She moved her chair closer to me. Last winter, I almost went crazy. The laboratory was like one big, ridiculous orgy. And I... I can't do that. I'm married. And happily married. Married? I've never seen your husband. He teaches at the university. And for me, the opportunity to come here was too good to pass up. Are you lonely? Desperate. Could you do something for me? I know it will sound strange. And so it was. Katie Ross is my pillow princess. She was 47 and so far above me in the pecking order that it was ridiculous. Elegant, attractive, and intelligent, she charmed me. She invited me to spend the night with her. In exchange, she looked after me, gave me the best laboratory assignments, and introduced me to her social circle. I was shocked when I was included in the conversation with her husband, and he thanked me for taking care of her and for being a gentleman. Communication with the elite of the station, with those for whom hundreds of other people came, was exciting. She cried when I told her that this would be my last winter. Every year we had to go on vacation. I admitted that I would not return from the next one. Her husband called me. Strange. He thanked me profusely for helping them both. He promised that if I ever needed their help, all I had to do was call. He said his wife had a going-away gift for me from both of them. 48 hours of bliss. She made all my fantasies come true and more. She didn't cry once until we took our last shower together and I washed her hair, dried it, and styled it. She was a logical person who rarely showed emotions. But not this evening. The tears streaming down her patrician face tore her heart. I will never forget Dr. Kathy Ross. I pampered her one last time, and she took me by the hand and led me to the largest conference room. When I entered it, I was shocked. Probably a hundred people gathered there to say goodbye. Almost the entire wintering team. The biggest party I've ever had here. I learned that only six people had been here longer than me. I probably made more friends during my stay here than I expected. Good people. I'll miss them. After five years of wintering, I was a highly paid, experienced, educated professional with a healthy bank account, which was growing thanks to smart investments under the guidance of one of the local scientists. I became a different person, both physically and psychologically. I still considered myself a loner, although I valued friendships. I was tired of being alone and wanted to return to society. My time with Dr. Ross changed me. I left with only a few memorabilia, including scars on my arms and hands from playing with knives, an ugly burn scar on my calf from inattention in the kitchen, and a nasty three-inch scar on my temple, almost hidden by my hairline, resulting from falling from a stepladder. I hoped it gave me character. I needed to come up with something. I was at a crossroads. Kathy and her friends helped me, and I took a contract job at Hurlburt Field in Fort Walton Beach. I had a master's degree in management and a bachelor's degree in computer science, several Cisco certifications, and a stack of written recommendations from the most famous people in the field. A list of recommendations that would make a professional athlete blush. One of Master Kino's friends helped register my company, and all payments for outside work I did for scientists were paid directly to me. It gave me experience and added more to my accounts than I could have ever expected. Katie and Master Kino didn't even tell me about it. I signed the papers they told me to and let them take care of me. It seemed to me that with my experience working with computer networks, going into IT would be the right decision. I was pleasantly surprised that they pay so well here. I think I can thank my friends at the station for that. I was 26, had eight years of networking experience, or so I claimed, since wiring was technically part of the network, a college degree, an 85-hour job where I didn't mind working long hours and no personal life. I missed my friends, and then Sue appeared in my life. So, Enigma, are you going to the 4th of July party at the Yacht Club? Enigma? Was she talking to me? The cute little brunette had me cornered and seemed to be getting quite a bit of enjoyment out of teasing me. I didn't know how to talk to girls, especially ones as beautiful as her. It wasn't so bad when I knew them, but strangers? It scared me to death. 
No, I muttered, looking for a way to escape. She grabbed my hand, laughing. No, you can't run away so easily. You have to come. I looked at her in surprise. Must? She nodded. I already told the girls that you are my mate. You don't want to make me a liar, do you? I had a habit of playing with my things when I was nervous, and I found myself holding a liberty quarter in my fingers, squeezing it in my palm, rolling it around my fingers, and doing similar things automatically. This calmed me down. Date? I asked. Come on. I know you need to date. You can't keep your secrets forever. We're going, that's all. She put a piece of paper in my hand. Pick me up at noon. Don't be late. By the way, we... We'll bring my famous German potato salad, so no motorcycle. Pick me up in your gorgeous Vetti. Yes, I had a Corvette. A 69 Stingray convertible, black, with a 7-liter engine. My first car. One of the drivers was moving overseas, and I got it for next to nothing. Just $24,000, less than I would pay for most new cars. I also had a 72 Moto Guzzi 850 GT that I fell in love with at first sight. For $4,000, he became mine. It's good that we are located next to several large military bases. Great used cars at reasonable prices can always be found for sale. I figured that in five years I had saved up most of my salary, which I nearly doubled through smart investments and side hustles. I was making good money. I deserve a few toys. I rarely drive both cars. They were collector's items so most of the mileage was on my 11-year-old F-150 pickup. Three great vehicles for less than the cost of one new, feature-rich extended cab truck. My father didn't raise fools. Well, maybe except for one thing. I stayed on the grill and the others eventually went back to the backyard. Our house was a favorite gathering place, and it was because of the yard. We were right on the bay, and there were only 30 meters of Bermuda lawns between the house and the water. We had a dock where my little Triton boat with two Yamaha 300 engines was tied up. Several large amber trees provided shade in the summer. The nearest tree trunk was 12 meters from the terrace where I was grilling. I know this for sure. Accurate to the centimeter. When I was setting up the grill for myself, I practiced my longest throws from there into a big, thick board that I hung from a tree. The perfect five-turn throw is the longest I throw regularly. The chicken is ready, I said to Sue, who was chatting with other girls while sipping margaritas on the porch. It seemed that she had already come to terms with my little trick. I thought she would like it better. I've never been able to get it right. The men walked to the pier, and on the way back they stopped to talk under a tree. Dale and Mark were playing with the cheap throwing knives I had left at the target. It was funny to watch half a dozen throws from a distance of about three meters, and not one stuck. This was the perfect distance for a simple throw with one spin, or even no spin. I'll go down and call them, said Sue, getting up and walking towards the steps. Don't worry, I'll get their attention, I replied. She frowned. No need to shout. I'll just be there for a second. I won't. Sit and finish your drink. I took out my favorite throwing knife and, making sure that they were at a distance of one and a half meters from the trajectory, leaned back and made a strong throw. A successful throw, it stuck almost in the center. I practiced enough to always hit the target, but the chance of the knife sticking was 90%. Hitting the bullseye was, at best, one out of ten. He entered with a loud thud and their heads swiveled as if on hinges, both stepping back. I heard their wives laugh. I picked up half a chicken on one of the knives. The supper is ready. Marie came over with a tray and I began to place the chicken on it. Where did you learn to throw like that? She asked. Abroad. To pass the time, I explained. Will we ever find out what you did there? She grinned. You know the rule, I teased. Even after almost a year, she still asked every time we saw each other. I know, I know. You would love to tell me, but you'll have to kill me. If I have to kill a beautiful girl like you, it will break my heart, I told her with a wink. There was no exit. I examined the Corvette in detail and folded down the canvas roof. The original seats were in storage, and I replaced them with fabric seats with new upholstery, 
so I wasn't too worried if I had to return in wet bathing suits. I was wearing surf shorts and a tacky Hawaiian shirt, a parting gift from my ukulele instructor. At 11.55, I parked at the apartment whose address Sue had given me. She came out with a large tray covered in foil just as I was about to approach the door. I opened the trunk, helped her put the potato salad in, and turned around and found myself in her arms. She kissed me quickly. That's a start. You won't be too nervous and you'll kiss me goodnight when you drop me off. First date, you know, so a kiss is all you'll get. But I can promise it'll be a good one. She winked at me and climbed into the passenger seat. I was stunned. I had no idea how to deal with a girl like Sue. I closed the trunk and got into the car. How old are you? She asked when I started the big seven-liter engine. Twenty-six. Really? Where did you get such cool toys? I saved up money. And it seems like a lot. I felt uncomfortable with this direction of the conversation. Enough. She leaned back, letting her hair down. Who would doubt that? The gods had blessed us with a beautiful day, and I had to admit that I loved driving the stingray through the city streets with the top down with a gorgeous girl sitting next to me. We were constantly being stared at. Damn, I look good in this car, Sue laughed. I should be mad at you for making me wait so long to ride. Sorry, I said, not knowing what kind of answer was required from me. No problem, handsome. I'll let you make it up to me. She turned in her seat. I'm one man's girl, mister. And when other girls start trying to get their claws into you, remember, you came with me and you'll leave with me. Got it? You understand perfectly well what I mean. I know how you act. Just not with me, okay? No games on the side. I won't tolerate this. No games on the side? Every time she opened her mouth, it put me in an even more difficult position. None. Of course, you will flirt and all that. I can hardly stop it since you are in public. But that's all. If you ever paw at one girl, it will be the last time you see all this. She said, opening her robe and showing me her exquisite body in a bikini. She giggled. Watch the road, Enigma. Let's get there safely and soundly. We understand each other, right? I hope so. Yes, I think so. She was like a leech. We arrived at an outdoor party. There were about 30 people with friends and spouses. From the moment I took her potato salad, she grabbed my arm and walked around me like some visiting celebrity. I only knew half a dozen of them by name, but I was quickly introduced to everyone. Someone shoved a beer into my hand, and when it was empty, they replaced it. I had no idea what the hell was going on. I met the girls, and Sue took over. We, of course, had options, but what kind of fun would it be without you? She explained. Options? I asked, still in complete confusion. She lowered my head and quickly kissed my cheek. Don't be like that, she pouted. Next time we will go with your company. You know, I already told them that we will come. Next time? Yes, I promise I will make amends. She made a face for her friends, and they giggled. Spit it out, Enigma. What were you really doing abroad? And no more nonsense about being on an iceberg in Antarctica. Asked the giggling redhead. Sue just jumped. Special operations, Aaron. No brainer. Crap. I worked in the special operations building. They must think that I belong to them. The truth is, I have no idea what these guys do. Although working on their computer systems, I figured I had the clearance to find out if I wanted to. True. I never thought about it. It was like a scientific organization. I did my job, they did theirs. OSP regularly invited Green Berets, Navy SEALs, and other special operations forces to train. I have dealt with many teleconferencing and training infrastructures. This is probably what caused the confusion. Where did you get this scar? Asked the tall blonde, leaning forward and running her finger across my forehead. I felt Sue tighten her grip on my hand. Fell, I explained. I didn't want to get into the details of wearing the wrong boots up the icy stairs. The girls giggled. Of course, I fell. I wonder how many guys died before you left after such a fall, asked Marie, a petite brunette. The blonde moved even closer. I smelled her coconut tanning lotion. 
She ran her hand down my arm, feeling for one of the ugliest scars I had earned by twirling knives for fun. A word of warning for those smart enough to listen. Don't use sharp kitchen knives when trying something new. 46 stitches. I bet there's a damn interesting story behind this, she purred sultrily, looking into my eyes almost point blank. Don't play with sharp knives, I said, earning even more chuckles from the audience. Heather? Sue said in a tense voice. The blonde didn't back down, and I could have sworn that Sue had pinched the circulation in my left arm. I bet you're good with a knife, Heather said. To tell the truth, I wasn't bad. I pulled out my balisong and started with some basic spins, then a zen flip into a cherry picker, finishing with a trebuchet exit. Yes, not bad, although Master Kino always swore that for me, style is more important than substance. All the girls took a few steps back, including the blonde. They looked at me as if I had grown a third eye. What? Do you always carry knives with you? Even on the beach? Aaron asked. Basically, I answered. Sue intervened. Come on, Aaron. Do you think that a guy like Mystery will ever be unarmed? I... Apparently not. Aaron shook her head. We need to talk, Sue said to her friends, pulling me by the hand. She pulled me down towards the water, then turned and practically jumped on me, pulling my head down and kissing me deeply. God, it was so cool. If I had been wearing panties, they would have been wet. I liked the kiss. I'm not going to deny it. I leaned over and kissed her again, as she didn't seem to mind. After a few seconds, she pulled away. Enough, Enigma. Otherwise, I'll seriously disgrace myself. Why do you call me Enigma? I asked. She looked surprised. Isn't that your nickname? I asked Margie who you were, and she said so. Margie, not surprising. She calls everyone Mr. She has a problem with my last name, Eulalia. Too many vowels, she says. I wonder what she would think of my buddy Amama. She calls me Mr. E for short. Just call me Trey, okay? Trey, that is 3003. Damn, she was weird. Yes, how three? Wow, this is so cool. What do you want to do now that we've introduced you? I wouldn't mind eating, I replied. I don't even doubt it. We need to maintain our strength. Let's go. I'm sure they will feed you. Few people had eaten yet, but she sat me down at the table and returned with a plate. You have to tell me what you think of my potato salad, she said proudly. At least a third of the plate was covered with her signature dish. A couple of minutes later, she returned with a plate for herself and the table began to fill up. Her girls quickly joined in, and Marie placed a plain brown bottle in front of me. My husband brews our own beer. He wants you to try it. I looked up, and she pointed to one of the guys standing by the refrigerator. I raised my beer in a silent toast. Three guys raised their bottles in my direction, almost synchronously. Do you mind talking to him a little later? Marie asked nervously. He's from Building B. Of course, if you want. She smiled widely, leaned over, and gave me a quick kiss on the cheek. God, you are the best, she said quietly. Because I'll drink her beer and talk to her husband? I was beginning to think that this crowd was too strange for me. Sue's potato salad was damn delicious. That's what I told her. You're not just saying that, she asked. No, I don't do that. If he sucked, I would say so. He's really good. The smirk on her face threatened into tear, the corners of her mouth. I should have guessed. You don't have to pretend too much, do you? I laughed. I'm a simple guy, Sue. God knows. She held out her fork and took a piece of sausage from my plate. You seem to like taking risks, I teased. I was even proud of myself. I felt much more comfortable around her and even her friends, even if they were weird. Her hand stopped. Sorry, I'll bring you more she said. Crap. My humor always went down like a lead balloon. I was just joking. You can help yourself to my sausage anytime. I heard giggling from across the table and saw Sue blush. I wasn't sure this was possible. Only later did I understand what I said. Oh God, he's blushing, Aaron whispered, and I'm sure I blushed even more. After the meal, Sue left me with the guys, including Marie's husband. Mark, he said, holding out his hand. Trey, 
I replied, shaking his hand. Thank you for the beer. Let me know if you want more. I have a supply. I looked into the refrigerator at his feet. There were probably four left there, and next to them were several empty bottles. One is enough. It would be wrong to take them all. No, I'm serious. Please, someone has to drink them, right? Thank you, I agreed, although in fact I would have preferred Guinness. Mark grinned and introduced me. The guys seemed more normal, talked about normal things and didn't ask me stupid questions. Well, they almost didn't ask. Dale, a tall, dark, blonde man, looked at the women. Sue, right? Some people are lucky. How are our girls compared to your last station? Prettier, younger, and not so serious, I honestly admitted. Most of those female scientists had no better sense of humor than I did. I heard more laughter at this party than during my year on the ice. All the guys laughed. Yes, I can imagine, said Mark. It's pretty quiet here compared to what's going on out there, I guess. A lot more blondes and redheads, I added. Typical male chatter. Wow, worth loving the good old USA. I'm Neil, said the third guy, picking up his bottle. I noticed he was drinking Bud. I'll drink that, I said, raising my bottle. The guys looked at each other, raised their beer bottles, and touched glasses with mine. Respect, Mark said quietly. They seemed like good guys. I took a sip from my bottle and remembered my father's favorite toast. May you have the memory to know where you have been, foresight to know where you're going, and the intelligence to know when you're going too far. No offense, Enigma. Mark looked at me nervously. Grievances? I laughed. Of course not. Here's to new friends then, I said, stepping back. You can call me Trey. God, I always felt like I was saying something wrong. He nodded quickly. Here's to new friends. Thank you, Trey. We ate at a table outdoors, and my unfortunate prank with the throwing knife seemed to be forgotten. We all laughed at Dale's stories. Damn, I wish I was half as interesting. However, I didn't do even a tenth of what he did. As usual, I kept pretty quiet and just listened. The drinks flowed freely, and no one felt much pain. Sue was clearly tipsy in her cheerful, flirtatious mood. I liked it. This almost always meant hot sex. She was amazing. Have you ever regretted giving up your old life? Mark asked. Rarely, I answered him. You know, most guys don't last more than a year. I lasted five years. Only six guys lasted longer. That's more than enough for any man. Five years, said Dale. Damn. So you're happy with the boring beach life now? Perfect. Sun, sand, good friends, and the best woman a man could ask for, I replied. The best woman? Sue grinned. Where is she? I'll rip her eyes out. Stupid. You are the only woman for me. Remember that first barbecue? How did I take you for the first time? Of course. Best. Day. The best. No games on the side. That was your condition. You will never have to worry about me. I am the only man, just like you, are the only woman. I was a little surprised when she dropped her glass. She apologized and got up to get a rag. When she returned, she cleaned up after herself, then walked over to where I was sitting. She looked upset. What happened, beauty? It's just a little mess. She sat on my lap. I'm a one-woman lover. I love you. Only you. No one else means anything to me. You know that, right? Of course, you are mine and I am yours. Everyone knows this. I looked around the table. Isn't it? They looked at me strangely. Of course, everyone knows that, Mark said hastily. Only yours. Dale nodded like a doll. I hugged her and felt her trembling. Are you feeling well? She nodded. Only you, Trey. I swear, you have to believe me. I know, relax. Let's just enjoy each other, okay? She kissed me quickly and then ran back into the house. Her bladder appeared to be the size of a shot glass. I admit it. I had a better time at the 4th of July party than I expected. I stopped drinking after the second glass of Mark's beer, switching to soft drinks. When you drive a sports convertible, you're setting yourself up for trouble. I wasn't going to drive drunk. After a while, Sue noticed this. 
Don't you want any more beer? I can't afford it. I already have a target on my back the size of New Jersey. I don't want to leave here drunk. I understand. She nodded. It must be difficult. Tolerate it. I still like to control everything. She grabbed my hand again and I pulled her towards me. Thank you for persuading me to come out. I have no practice communicating with a large company. I didn't make myself look like an idiot, did I? No, never. She grinned. Can I consider the first dad a success? Absolutely, I'm having a great time. She moved in for a kiss, a real kiss. Would you like to invite me for ice cream later? With pleasure. Great. This could be our second date. Second date? I smiled. I never go all out until the third, she teased. Never? Even for you, Enigma. She kissed me quickly. Although it's damn tempting. She grabbed my hand. Come on. Time to say goodbye. We walked around the circle and I received more hugs than I expected and many invitations to other events. Sue bore it stoically. She liked Baskin Robbins world-class chocolate and butter pecans. I chose a simple chocolate shake made with French vanilla and chocolate syrup. Do I have to call you myself? She asked. For what? Well, you know, you had a good time today, didn't you? Great. Do you like me? In my opinion, you are simply wonderful. So you'll call yourself? You won't make me run after you? I'll call. When? I laughed. We're still on our second date, I told her. A little patience, okay? This is all new to me. You're not going to call Diana or Aaron? I saw Diana put her number in your pocket. Don't pretend she didn't do it. Why didn't you just tell her no? Am I not good enough? Three dates. It's not too long, is it? She looked genuinely upset. I'm not going to call either Diana or Aaron. And others, too. Marie is married. She was just flirting. Don't... Don't ruin her marriage, Trey. Mark is a good guy. He even gave you two of his beers. He never does that. You don't do that. Really? You don't ruin marriages for fun? Nobody but you, Sue. I'm not going to call anyone but you. Do you promise? I promise. I am a one-woman man, just like you are a one-man woman. Am I that woman, Trey? God, how fast she moved. I've never met anyone like her. I looked her over. She was beautiful, and today... She was definitely the most beautiful. Her bikini was amazingly tight. It was easy to talk to her. Maybe a little crazy, but nothing too bad. What the hell did she see in a low life like me? I saw her shrink under my gaze. I... I'll treat you right, Trey. I swear. You'll never regret it. I'm better than any of them. Do you want me to be your man? I asked. Yes. If you accept me. Then I'm only yours, and you're only mine. Otherwise, nothing good will come of it, right? She laughed and grabbed my hands. Will you take me home, Trey? Certainly. At the door, she kissed me, as promised. The best kiss of my life, and that's an understatement. In my opinion, it simply could not have been better. When we separated, I had a rock-hard boner. It was a great first two dates, Trey. Thank you. She quickly kissed me again and left. I returned to my car and, before reaching the end of the block, dialed her number. Hello? She answered after three rings. Hi, Sue. It's me. I had a great time today. Did you forget something? Did something happen? No. I promised to call. What are you doing next Friday? A couple of seconds of silence. Could you come in for a minute? Of course, I'm very close. Great. Meet me downstairs. I drove around the block for a few minutes while I made my way back, dealing with the local traffic. She ran and jumped into my car. Go. Where? Anywhere. Just take me for a ride, okay? Definitely crazy. I went to the water. It was already dark and the fireworks were just starting. Can we watch the fireworks for a while? She asked. Of course. Do you want to go down and walk along the beach? With pleasure. Do you mind? Not at all. We spent an hour watching the fireworks at each end of the beach. We walked hand in hand 
not talking about anything except the pyrotechnic show. I let her set the pace and direction, and the conversations were still going on when we got back to the car. Will you take me home? I laughed as I opened her door. Your carriage is waiting for you, my lady. I walked her to the door and received another kiss. Thank you for my third date, she said, smiling shyly. Will I seem too intrusive if I invite you for coffee? No, I think that would be very kind. That girl from the tanker? Someday I will have to find her and thank her. She was quite assertive and didn't hesitate to tell me how she liked it. We were together for two days, most of which we spent in bed. I was also indebted to Dr. Kathy Ross. She became convinced that there was one thing I could do very well. Very, very good, judging by her moans. Their training was very successful. After three dates, Sue didn't mind going all out, even if all three happened within ten hours. An hour later, she was shaking. She deserved at least half a dozen. God, that was strong. Now I... I know what you can do if you want. Did you feel good too? I can be better. You were beautiful. Best of all. Better? Do you think so? I'm... just an amateur. The best for me. Now exactly what I need. She smiled, climbed onto my chest, and kissed my neck. If you need it again, I hope you remember who to come to. I can be what you need if you give me a chance. Consider that you got it, I whispered, wondering if one more time would be enough for me. Since then we have been together. We got engaged three months later. We got married less than a year later. We spent almost four months searching for the perfect home, and when we found this one for sale, I knew it was the one. It needed some work, but that never bothered me. When I paid cash for the house, Sue was dumbfounded. How can you afford this? She asked. I told you that I am very frugal. It took three quarters of my savings, but it was worth it. I loved knowing that this place was mine, and I would never have to worry about having somewhere to live again. The house was perfect. Not too big, but with a large two-car garage and a carport that could fit two more. Embankment, pier, with a beautiful terrace, quiet area, everything you can dream of. We had a wonderful life. Together we earned almost 200000 a year, with almost no expenses. In the first year we were able to save about 60000 Marie and Mark lived just over a kilometer away from us. They became our closest friends, we had a lot of them. More accurately, Sue had a lot of them. But they were always kind to me. We loved each other and I couldn't imagine my life without her. Dusk was falling and I was sitting on the edge of the pier alone. I was hopeless as a host. Everything I did turned out badly. I tried to fit in, joke, act like everyone else. And he always ruined everything. I wonder how many friends I would have had if it weren't for Sue. Marie came down and sat next to me, quietly sipping from a glass of wine. You know something, right? I know? What? Damn, I didn't know anything. Even how to organize a party. I didn't answer. She looked over her shoulder and I followed her gaze. My wife and both husbands seemed to be arguing. She loves you, you know. It's not too late. Too late? She looked at me and I saw that her eyes were wet. Don't, Trey, please. You've done enough. Everything stopped. And it wouldn't have led to anything anyway. They were stupid, but you have to forgive them. Forgive them? I asked, perplexed. Why the hell should they be forgiven? If anything, I should have been the one to apologize to them for ruining yet another party. Please, for my sake, you are better than them. You must stop torturing them. You have already shown everyone everything. She grabbed my hand, squeezing it tightly. I love him. He's an idiot, but he's my idiot, and I don't know what I'd do without him. There are a lot of idiots around, I muttered. Me included. I know. I'm so sorry. I suspected, but you, you knew. It was obvious. God, how could they be so stupid? She snapped. Everyone knows that you are the last person in the world worth messing with. Everyone knows. I chuckled and sighed that's for sure. She took my face in her hands and looked into my eyes. No, nobody knows. It's our secret. You stopped it. 
Now you have to let it go. Please, I'm begging you, Trey. Leave it this time. For me. For all of us. She learned a lesson. They all learned. If they screw it up again, I'll help you bury the bodies. Please, stop, will you? Damn it. I couldn't figure out why the hell she was so upset. It was unpleasant for me to see her in this state. I generally hated seeing any woman upset. This was my weakness. Of course, for your sake, Marie, I told her. She burst into tears, hugged me. Her arms were like steel hoops. I tried to calm her down by stroking her hair. I'm very sorry, I said. My father taught me this. With any woman who cries 90% of the time, I'm sorry was a great start. She pulled away and I felt her lips press against mine for a moment. God, we don't deserve you. None of us. Never apologize to me, Enigma. I don't deserve you, I grinned. She tried to smile, but I saw the corners of her mouth twitch. Don't cry, beauty. It breaks my heart. She looked back at the rest of the party, and I saw that we were being watched. It's time to go back, I think. Stop talking to them, I said. She laughed and took my hand when I offered to help her up. Is it over? Yes, I said. It was too late. There was still a lot to clean up. Thank you. I... I will atone for my guilt someday. I swear. Okay. Next time bring your own crab cakes. She laughed and it sounded almost hysterical. I have an idiot to take home and build. Don't be too hard on Sue. She really loves you. I love her. I know. Everyone knows. Otherwise, I think our parties would be half as big in the future, right? Hell, if I didn't have Sue, there wouldn't be any parties. That's what I said. She let go of my hand as we approached the deck. I didn't even notice she was holding it. Marie walked up to her husband and slapped him, strongly. He didn't say anything, just lowered his head. You got a reprieve, asshole. All three of you got it. Don't even think about trying again, or I'll pull the trigger myself. Do you understand? She shouted. I saw his face turn red, and he nodded slowly. She kicked him in the leg. Damn it! Man, fucking apologize, you piece of shit! I'm sorry, baby. It's not what you think, he whispered. Not in front of me, idiot, she screamed. She scared me. I had never seen her like this. I was glad I was married to Sue. She never lost her temper. I looked at my wife and she bowed her head. She stood up and walked over to me, clutching my hand like she did on our first date. She lowered her head and pressed herself close to me. I, I'm so sorry, Trey. Mark spoke. I swear it didn't go too far. He looked down at Sue. You too, Sue. I never wanted to. Just go away, she said softly. Please. He nodded and turned away. Marie came over and hugged me. Thank you. She took Sue's chin and lifted her face. You and I will talk later, privately. You should thank your lucky stars, you know. I know. Sue nodded. Annie looked as confused as I did. Dale? He looked like he was waiting for the other shoe to drop. Marie stared at him. What are you waiting for? Monogrammed invitations? He shook his head nervously and slowly walked towards us. He moved as if his legs were lead. Dale was a tall guy. He stopped a meter away from us. Sorry, dude. It was stupid. We know. Nothing much happened. Just talking went too far. If, if you can forget about it, then I swear to God, you'll never have to worry about anything like that again. I swear. He was shaking. Please, dude. Whatever you do, I will understand. But I have a wife and children. They are not to blame for anything. I looked at Annie. She was almost as good as Sue. I tried to smooth over the awkward situation. A beauty, not a wife, I said, winking at Annie. God, do you really think I don't know this? I must have been out of my mind when I got involved in this. He muttered something and I let him ramble on until he stopped, staring at me. Is this the price, my Annie? I felt Sue grab my hand. How about next time I provide meat? And Annie, dessert? He looked at me and his wife. My Annie for dessert? He stuttered. He was acting strange. Yes, let him bring his amazing marble cake and we'll be even. Best cake I've ever eaten. This girl was a genius when it came to baking. Dale's eyes opened wide. I involuntarily stepped back as he fell to his knees, covering his face with his hands. 
You're not kidding me, are you, Enigma? Please, please, tell me it's not. It's over? Yes, it's late, I said, feeling clearly awkward. He looked up, and I saw tears on his face. I turned away so he wouldn't feel awkward. I'm sorry, Sue. I'm so damn sorry, he muttered, standing up. I looked back, and Annie was standing next to him. I'm very sorry, I said. My father taught me this. With any woman who cries 90% of the time, I'm sorry was a great start. She pulled away, and I felt her lips press against mine for a moment. God, we don't deserve you. None of us. Never apologize to me, Enigma. I don't deserve you, I grinned. She tried to smile, but I saw the corners of her mouth twitch. Don't cry, beauty. It breaks my heart. She looked back at the rest of the party, and I saw that we were being watched. It's time to go back, I think. Stop talking to them, I said. She laughed and took my hand when I offered to help her up. Is it over? Yes, I said. It was too late. There was still a lot to clean up. Thank you. I... I will atone for my guilt someday. I swear. Okay. Next time bring your own crab cakes. She laughed and it sounded almost hysterical. I have an idiot to take home and build. Don't be too hard on Sue. She really loves you. I love her. I know. Everyone knows. Otherwise, I think our parties would be half as big in the future, right? Hell, if I didn't have Sue, there wouldn't be any parties. That's what I said. She let go of my hand as we approached the deck. I didn't even notice she was holding it. Marie walked up to her husband and slapped him, strongly. He didn't say anything, just lowered his head. You got a reprieve, asshole. All three of you got it. Don't even think about trying again, or I'll pull the trigger myself. Do you understand? She shouted. I saw his face turn red, and he nodded slowly. She kicked him in the leg. Damn it! Man, fucking apologize, you piece of shit! I'm sorry, baby. It's not what you think, he whispered. Not in front of me, idiot, she screamed. She scared me. I had never seen her like this. I was glad I was married to Sue. She never lost her temper. I looked at my wife and she bowed her head. She stood up and walked over to me, clutching my hand like she did on our first date. She lowered her head and pressed herself close to me. I... I'm so sorry, Trey. Mark spoke. I swear it didn't go too far. He looked down at Sue. You too, Sue. I never wanted to. Just go away, she said softly. Please. He nodded and turned away. Marie came over and hugged me. Thank you. She took Sue's chin and lifted her face. You and I will talk later, privately. You should thank your lucky stars, you know. I know. Sue nodded. Annie looked as confused as I did. Dale? He looked like he was waiting for the other shoe to drop. Marie stared at him. What are you waiting for? Monogrammed invitations? He shook his head nervously and slowly walked towards us. He moved as if his legs were lead. Dale was a tall guy. He stopped a meter away from us. Sorry, dude. It was stupid. We know. Nothing much happened. Just talking went too far. If, if you can forget about it, then I swear to God, you'll never have to worry about anything like that again. I swear. He was shaking. Please, dude. Whatever you do, I will understand. But I have a wife and children. They are not to blame for anything. I looked at Annie. She was almost as good as Sue. I tried to smooth over the awkward situation. A beauty, not a wife, I said, winking at Annie. God, do you really think I don't know this? I must have been out of my mind when I got involved in this. He muttered something and I let him ramble on until he stopped, staring at me. Is this the price, my Annie? I felt Sue grab my hand. How about next time I provide meat? An Annie, dessert? He looked at me and his wife. My Annie for dessert? He stuttered. He was acting strange. Yes, let him bring his amazing marble cake and we'll be even. Best cake I've ever eaten. This girl was a genius when it came to baking. Dale's eyes opened wide. I involuntarily stepped back as he fell to his knees, covering his face with his hands. You're not kidding me, are you, Enigma? Please, please, tell me it's not. It's over? Yes, it's late, I said, feeling clearly awkward. He looked up, and I saw tears on his face. I turned away so he wouldn't feel awkward. I'm sorry, Sue.
I'm so damn sorry, he muttered, standing up. I looked back, and Annie was standing next to him. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.